Great. Well, welcome everyone that's online and in person to the RSC's Wednesday Public Seminar Series. Uh, the title of today's event, as you can see on the screen, is a refugee-led study on uh, refugee-led organizations in East Africa. Um, this is a hybrid event. It's being run partly in Oxford from the Refugee Study Center, and then online for those of you that want to be joining us virtually. Um, we have a very full house on the screen today. As you can see, there are a number of panelists that Bahati is going to introduce. So I'll turn it over to her now. We have about 60 minutes total, and we're going to try to keep the presentation to 40, 45 minutes uh, to leave time for some Q&A. If you do have any questions throughout the seminar, feel free to leave them in the Q&A function that I think you can find on Zoom. Um, and if anyone that's in the RSC, you're welcome to ask any questions as well, if you would like. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to Bahati, who is chairing this session. Thank you, Indoni. Um, good afternoon or good evening to all of you, and welcome to this session. Uh, my name is Bahati Ernestine, and I'm part of the RLRH uh, team. That's the Refugee-Led Research Hub. Uh, and just to briefly introduce this hub, the RLRH, the Refugee-Led Research Hub, is an initiative of the Refugee Studies Center and the British Institute of East Africa, which is based in Nairobi. Um, that's where we have our offices um, housed by the BIA, the British Institute of East Africa. Um, it's actually the first social uh, science project from Oxford with a physical space outside of the UK, uh, which is great. Um, and we are the program that is currently running the RSC and BIA fellowship, where we have 12 fellows currently um, who all have a displacement background and are amazing, and they are studying in this academic year. Um, this is also the research group that is undertaking several research uh, activities and projects, uh, such as the refugee-led organization study, um, uh, supporting the RSRI initiative, that's the Refugee Self-Reliance Initiative, and looking to do um, various studies and projects relating to work rights and, and other things. Um, the current team uh, is comprised of uh, 40 colleagues throughout um, our, our affiliations, and that's through the fellowship, uh, the research pillar, um, the graduate attachment scheme, and others. And out of these 40, we have 37 with a displacement background, which is something that um, we are really proud of. Uh, if interested, uh, you can learn more about us and this initiative um, through a launch event that we will be having later this month. Uh, the date will be confirmed and the details will be shared with you by the RSC if interested. But tonight, we are here to learn more and share with you guys about the refugee-led organization uh, study. Uh, this is a study that has been funded by the Open Society Foundation, uh, the Bosch Foundation, uh, the Global Whole Being Fund, and the International Development Research Center. Uh, and to present to you today, we have our uh, the people who are leading this study uh, with the Refugee-Led Research Hub, uh, and I will introduce them. They are our panelists today. Uh, we have Abis Getachu. I don't know if I've pronounced that correctly. Um, then we have Andira Kara. Uh, we have Mark Okello. Uwezo Ramazani and Mary Gitahi. I don't know if we have uh, time for them to just say a brief hello. Uh, maybe starting with Abis. Thank you, Bahati. Uh, my name is Abis Ketacho and uh, I'm the research lead in the RLO study in East Africa. Thanks, Abis. Uh, Andira? Hi, my name is Andira Kara. I'm the lead researcher for Kenya. Okay, uh, Mary. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Mary Wanjiro Gitahi, and I am the lead researcher for Uganda. Okay, Uwezo. Hello, everyone. My name is Uwezo Ramazan. I'm the lead researcher for Tanzania. And last but not least, we have Marco Kello. Hello, members. I'm Marco Kello from the DAP Refugee Camp, doing research from uh, the DAP 
in relation to the refrigerator organization. Welcome. Thank you all. And those are uh, the wonderful panelists that we have uh, here for you today. And back to you, Endon. Sorry, um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to the presenters. So whoever would like to begin the presentation, please go ahead. Thank you. Sorry, who, whoever would like to begin the presentation, you are very welcome to now. Thank you. Um, so Mary was to begin the presentation, but I think um, she, because of internet connection, she'll join us later. So I'll take over. Um, so welcome all to a refugee-led study on refugee-led organization in East Africa. This is um, this is a study uh, on refugee-led organization, their responses and impact on displaced communities in East Africa. The study is led by the Local Engagement Refugee Research Network, known as LEARN, and in partnership with Refugee Study Center, RSC at Oxford. Um, and it's also in collaboration with the Dadaab Response Association, uh, DRA in East Africa. And this is uh, funded by um, Bosch Foundation, the Global World Being Fund, and the International Development Research Center as well. And um, this research is led by uh, refugee researchers from the beginning to the end. Um, uh, next slide, please. So like mentioned earlier, these are presenters. Um, we've just presented ourselves just earlier. Uh, we all have a displacement background from different countries. For instance, Mary comes from Kenya but, and leads the research uh, in Uganda and she's based in Nakivale currently, settlement in Uganda. And Uwezo is a former refugee from Democratic Republic of, Tanz of Congo and is the lead researcher for Tanzania and currently lives in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. And um, Mark Okelo is a Ugandan refugee uh, based in Dadaab and is uh, the director for the Dadaab Response Association known as the DRA. Um, and then um, I am originally from Sudan and I'm leading the research in Kenya and I'm currently in Nakuru, Kenya. And then we have Abis, uh, who is from um, a, for, a Ritani, uh, a former refugee, and who's the lead researcher in Ethiopia and currently based in Addis Ababa. Um, so the rationale of this study, there's, there's been an emerging evidence that refugee-led organizations in East Africa play a vital role. Um, I think um, I'll... Asha in Mary, I think she's back. Mary, you can continue. Um, thank you uh, very much, Anthera. Um, there has been emerging evidence that uh, refugee-led organizations in East Africa uh, play a vital role in meeting community needs. And this is because they are very intimate with experiences from the communities that they live in. Sometimes they're even more effective, efficient, and legitimate because they have a day-to-day -day experience of what refugees uh, do go through on a daily basis. So refugee-led organizations are increasingly taking center stage in the context, especially during the context of COVID-19, uh, whereby the traditional INGOs faced a lot of restrictions in terms of movement. So it was the refugee-led organizations that were closer to their communities and they would be seen supplying masks, for example, raising awareness on measures against COVID-19 and even sometimes are supplying uh, sanitation. So 
so uh, what are the research objectives of the RLO study, refugee-led organization study? Uh, the nature of the response. What is the nature, scope, and practices of refugee-led organizations in Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, and Ethiopia? We all understand that these refugee-led organizations come in different shapes. They also come in different sizes. They are formed with different objectives. So this study wants to understand the nature of the response. Secondly, they want to, the study wants to understand the perceived impact of this response. And uh, this is a qualitative study. We will not be mention, we will not be measuring the impact. However, we would want to understand understand uh, the perceived impact of refugee-led organizations' responses on displaced communities, especially the communities that they do serve. And this is from the eyes of regional actors, the states, local authorities, humanitarian and development service providers, even host communities, uh, because uh, we've come to find out that sometimes host communities also benefit, and uh, more specifically, the refugees themselves who are the end beneficiaries uh, of services being offered by these refugee-led organizations. Third, we do want to understand the factors that condition the response and impact of refugee-led organizations in Uh, uh, the type of impact it has in a country that is operating or, or a small sphere that it has. So what factors explain the variations in response and impact of RLOs in East Africa? Thank you, Pauline. Next slide, please. Uh, this study is going to take place in 10 sites. Uh, in Ethiopia, it's going to take place in Addis Ababa. Melkadida camp and Pumido camp. In Kenya, the study will take place in Nairobi, Kakuma camp, Kalobai settlement, and Adab camp. In Tanzania, the study is going to take place in Nyarugusu camp, Nduta camp, and Dar es Salaam. In Uganda, the study will take place in Kampala, Nakivale, and Bidibidi refugee settlement. I'll pass over the mic to Uwezo. Thank you, Mary, for the great introduction. Thank you for giving me the floor. Our first review explores the liberation of refugee organizations in East Africa. In this presentation, I'm going to spotlight just a few factors from the literature. Basically, the literature reveals that little has been researched on refugee organizations in East Africa. Currently, in order to understand refugee organizations in Kenya and Uganda, the global government book is a literature bank in this region. In Ethiopia and Tanzania, there is limited information about refugee organizations. This may be due to the legal restrictions of the of refugee organizations in this country. We also found that refugee organizations themselves perform organizations in both urban and capital. Setting. We also found that by doing so, it may just suggest that these effective organizations may be more effective than traditional humanitarian actors because they are more trusted by the community in the state. And that they have strong social networks within the same community. On their nature, they often start as an informal group to fill the gaps they identify in their community. Others are sometimes the continuation of the existing organizations in their home countries. This is the case of South Sudanese refugee leaders in Kampala who are often the head of the existing organizations in North Sudan. In countries where the legal system allows, for instance, in Kenya and Uganda, some of them formalize themselves through registration, they get registered as community organizations or as non-government organizations. For example, in Uganda, we have the African refugee 
for development. And in that now we have a resilience action international who have been acquired in non-governmental organizations that us. Yet many of them remain separate and organized as operators. In some cases, vigilant organizations are collected or confounded between refugees and the host community members as a result of legal requirements. In Uganda, for instance, there is a higher representation of citizens in a regulated organization leadership structure. And these regulated organizations go on and form what we call refugee-led organization network. In Kampala, for example, their network as of, of last year was comprised of over 20 refugee-led organizations. In the wake of COVID-19, refugee-led organizations have also adapted their activities to fill new gaps in the community. For example, hope of children and women in Uganda started distributing food and soap to refugees in Uganda in the Ndenji area of Kampala, and the Youth United for Social Mobilization ran information campaigns to raise awareness of COVID-19 among refugees. In terms of their activities, they mainly focus on self-reliance by providing professional training, protection and assistance, by engaging, engaging in provision of food, shelter, education, advocacy, attempting to change local and international structures which may hinder and enable refugees access to such provisions. They also engage in political activism in peace building activities in their own countries from their host countries. About their impact, there is little evidence. The little evidence that exists demonstrates that refugee-led organizations play a key role in providing services to their fellow community members. For instance, in Nairobi, the LGBTQ Sorry, Wezo. Sorry, Wezo. It's very hard to hear you. And uh, maybe, Mary, can you continue, please? It's very hard to hear you, Wezo. Maybe if Mary can continue. Okay. Um, um, thank you to their communities as a matter of very easy for them to actually become part of solution facing within the communities. Uh, this is, a, for example, uh, in Duale 2020, our laws are collected by refugees. Then We look at the impact of our laws uh, in of refugee-led organizations on the communities that they serve. Uh, beyond This is beyond anecdotal evidence, but potential factors that determine uh, the nature and impact of RLOs are the external relations and influence. Sorry, Mary, we, you're breaking up quite a bit so we cannot hear you. 
Uh, maybe we can try turning back to Wizzle. Access to finance and fast. Thank you, Pauline. Um, Wizzle, are you still able to speak? Yes, but I don't know whether I'm audible enough now. Yes, it's a lot better. Sorry about that, please go ahead. Okay, about the resources, it is challenging for refugee-led organizations to get funds from the UN and international non-government organizations. Alternatively, some refugee-led organizations rely on diaspora to get funding. In terms of the setting, in urban and like in camps, refugee-led organizations emerge as a result of limited assistance from the UNHCR. Regulatory framework in countries where the legal system allows refugee-led organizations to be registered, those registered are better positioned to attract funding because registration is one of the requirements by donors. Refugee-led organization leadership also is a key. A few of them flourish mainly because of their founders' exceptional leadership and the creation of transnational networks that offer opportunities for funding. Next. Next slide, please. Refugee-led organizations struggle to register legally in the four countries of the study, even when they have the right to. In Kenya and Uganda, the law allows them to be registered, but yet bureaucratic challenges hinder refugee-led organizations to get registered. In Ethiopia and Tanzania, it is nearly impossible for refugee-led organizations to get registered. Next slide, please. Difficulties in defining refugee-led organizations. In the literature, a refugee-led organization is defined differently due to the different displacement settings and the regulatory frameworks. Our discussion on what a refugee-led organization is was therefore based on, among other issues, whether the definition should include not-for-profit entities only, or it should also consider for-profit organizations, whether the definition should refer to only organizations and groups that are created and led by refugees themselves, or it should also include refugee efforts in organizations co-founded with host community members and the refugee efforts in organizations with strong refugee representation. For instance, organizations not founded by refugees, but led by refugees like Dafi Kenya Student Association. Whether it should also include the registered organizations or include even unregistered organizations, or whether it should refer to organizations responding to the needs of refugees and or related communities to avoid excluding organizations that support only one group. After that discussions, on the screen is the LEN definition of a refugee-led organization that stresses group participation of refugees and asylum seekers for the common good. This definition is still evolving, and with this study, we hope to be building on it. Thank you for listening, and over to you, Mark, for the desk review findings in the data. Okay, thank you so much, Oweso. And thank you, everybody. I'm here in the DAP, and uh, from the DAP, we are dealing with uh, the issue of uh, understanding all these other activities related to the refugee debt organizations through the, the DAP Response Association with uh, four researchers from the DAP. So from here, the DAP refugee camps 
comprises of three camps. We have Hifo, Hagadera, and the Gahale. All of them have been founded in 91 and 92. So the nationalities that are within the DAP, we have Kenyans, Somalis, South Sudanese, Sudanese, Congolese, Burundians, Ugandans, Eritreans, Ethiopians, Rwandans, and other nationalities. By 2021, January, we had a population of uh, 223, 817 people. Uh, if you see the pictures of uh, the DAP from above, the aerial view of the DAP is on the right hand side. And then in the left, you can see and understand that the majority of the refugees are mostly women and children. So that, that is the composition of the people we do have here in the DAP. The death review in the DAP, that is the next slide, please. Uh, we source the death review from the academic writings, from journals, articles, newspapers, novels, the leaf wave, UNCR website, gray materials. All these were sourced online through the Google Scholar. And uh, the history of refugee led organizations within the DAP. Next slide, please. Uh, when the camp started in 1991 and 92, uh, the emergency protection issues were related to water, shelter, health, and the likes. So education was uh, not a priority, but eventually with uh, the existence of the DAF for a longer time, the community had to think of how to start and ensure that their children learn. So they initiated uh, schools under trees. And uh, eventually the agency sourced for funding and uh, took over the responsibility from the community. So here in the DAP, we see that UNCR and implementing partners collaborate with refugees in advocacy for social change and other activities. At the same time, we have also have refugee-based community justice system, which sustains peace and ensures that people live in diversity. Currently, also, we have the global change policies that favors the refugee organization to flourish. And therefore, we see that this will also favor uh, the people within the DAP to flourish. And the next slide gives us uh, the kind of refugee led organizations that will be studied in the DAP. In our study, we shall look at the community court and justice, justice system. We shall also see the feminist environmental activism, community advocacy for social changes like egalitarianism, gender equity. We have minority right group, environment management, youth umbrella groups, community-based organizations providing education materials and training organizations for people living with disability, awareness campaign groups of health partners, sexual gender-based violence, and engaging men through accountable practices. And in the next slide, we have uh, uh, our wonderful lady, Faria Ibrahim Farah, who won the US Award for Courage in 2008. And then the, the, the right hand side, you see women engage in feminist environment to activities. And uh, the other slide down there, next slide, there is an, a, a refugee led organization that was doing training of youth to mitigate the issue of COVID-19 suicide in 2020. A lot of youth, because of a uh, lack of uh, education and so on, were involved in committing suicide. And also some attempted, a lot of them also attempted suicide. The next slide, please. And then we have a, uh, the, in the other slide, we have also the coconut. The next slide, please, whoever is.
Mark, I think we'd love to. Can you hear us? Well, it looks like technology is not being kind to us in these first uh, three segments, but if we want to move on to the next section, that would be appreciated. Thank you. So I will just um, probably finish Mark's presentation and then join in with um, positionality. So Mark wanted to highlight some challenges in Dadaab, which um, re is related to uh, lack of funds and to expand the activities, um, the government and the legal restrictions, and also um, lack of support by international organization, among other challenges that uh, he highlighted. Um, with that in mind, um, the ARILO study takes in, um, is very keen in interrogating our identity with respect to our community, hence uh, positionality. We all, rec we recognize that refugee researchers um, or refugee research is often conducted by outsiders. Uh, so capturing our experiences as insiders um, in this research will be very interesting. So positionality um, is both an individual's worldview uh, of the position they have chosen in a certain research and um, positionality uh, or the position of, um, of a researcher is usually defined um, during the actual interaction with um, with their research participants. Um, so we, uh, we think that it's not something that is predefined, but negotiated in the process between uh, the researcher and the participant. And critical research on um, have um, stressed on refugees, especially on refugees have argued that on greater consideration of positionality and also openness and critical reflexivity. So in Arilo's study, as we've seen, the research leads, most of them identify as displaced uh, persons and that position them as insider researchers and who share common uh, social experience. Some uh, share identity status, some culture and even languages with their participants. Some of them even live in the camps and others uh, live in urban set settings. For instance, the Dadaab Response Association live in um, Dadaab camp. So far, um, our position has um, influenced some stages in our research. For instance, when we were mapping out um, Arelos, uh, our local knowledge and uh, really impacted how uh, we're going to identify or identify those uh, refugee-led organizations that were not even um, were not did not have a social media presence or um, did not were not uh, a lot of community members or people from outside would not recognize them. We also um, noticed that the female refugee leads among us were very much aware of uh, the gender dynamics between us and were very keen in in looking for uh, refugee-led organizations that were led by women. And we anticipate so much uh, more during the data collection. We, and um, we view that uh, maybe our advantages would be the knowledge, the existing knowledge that we have already on our laws and our communities, and hopefully the access to locations uh, that we've chosen. And we also understand that um, factors such as knowledge and even the insights and even our lived experiences of um, everyday life uh, with our participants can bring challenges too. And uh, challenges such as biasness, entanglement with our research participants, and sometimes even assumptions uh, by 
by the participants about who we are and and what we are doing and also their cooperation for instance if it's about funding they would prefer an outsider for instance uh because of um assuming that they might get um, immediate help as someone that they know who is their friend their child and their community member um, we are planning to capture all this experiences uh, using two methods. Uh, firstly, we would use uh, what we call or what we've adopted a social identity map, which would be our initial piece of reflexivity. And it will help us to reflect on how our social identity may influence our research interests, um, the methods are going to choose and even research questions uh, that we've already um, chosen. And it will also help us to be sensitive and respectful to our participants. We will also use um, weekly journals uh, to record our impressions, to record our thoughts and ideas, and also to record our similarities and differences, um, especially uh, during the focus group discussions. And um, having said that on our positionality, I will now turn to Avis uh, to explore the methods that we will use to answer the research questions in ARILO study. Thank you, Andira. Uh, thank you very much. And um, so uh, regarding the methods, uh, qualitative and exploratory approach uh, uh, will be used to uh, address the research questions, the research problems that Mary had mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, and uh, in the data collection, we are going to use two phases of data collection of two uh, in the data, in the qualitative data collection, we are going to use two phases. Uh, it's phase one and phase two. So, um, the phase one uh, is about uh, the mapping of the RLOs. So uh, under the mapping of the RLOs, we are going to use uh, two methods of uh, one, the disk review, and the other one is the rapid format uh, key format interview. So under uh, the disk review, we are going to, uh, uh, main, we are going to mainly uh, deal with, uh, the, with the RLOs that have online presence. And also we are uh, uh, also, we, are, we have also been working on the, literatures that have been done uh, on the RLOs and regarding the rapid combat uh, key format interviews we are, we are uh, working on uh, having a quick call phone calls uh, with uh, diverse stakeholders who we believe that there are RLOs so especially in Kenya and Uganda there are a number of uh, RLOs uh, uh, however in Tanzania and Ethiopia we are uh, you, we have a diverse uh, stakeholders to uh, conduct these rapid funded interviews. So uh, it's very, to have this preliminary mapping is very important, uh, basically to avoid uh, overlooking smaller and less resourced RLOs that contribute to the uh, well-being of the community. So after completing the mapping uh, of the RLOs, now the selection is uh, going to be conducted based on the diversity. Uh, so uh, this diversity is mainly based on the camp setting versus urban setting, uh, and also the registration status, whether they are formal or informal. Um, also the nationality, the gender, social status, age, uh, and, and other identities uh, of the RLO leaders, of the RLOs that uh, we, are, we have mapped out, and also the level of uh, the, external, the external relations and influence of uh, of non-refugee actors. So uh, this includes also host communities and also uh, others as well. So now after mapping out, we are going to deal with uh, actually the data collection phase. And in the data collection, uh, uh, we are going to conduct a, a, an in-depth qualitative uh, key, key informant interview with 15 RLOs. In, in addition to this, we also uh, conduct focus group discussions with RLO, the beneficiaries, uh, like beneficiaries from the responses of the RLOs and also non-beneficiaries. Non-beneficiaries are the ones who are uh, referring to the potential beneficiaries, uh, uh, but non-beneficiaries and also with RLO managers, staffs and volunteers and also the representatives as well. So uh, having these focus group discussions, in addition, we are going to have the key format interview with the RLO leaders and also the diverse, stick of the, the diverse uh, external stakeholders, including the UN agencies, uh, 
uh, uh, INGOs, uh, local NGOs, local administrators, state representatives, and community uh, representatives as well, and, um, and also other diverse stakeholders. So an uh, in-depth qualitative data collection uh, basically allows uh, allow us to understand uh, uh, the uh, response and the impact of uh, the RLOs um, that is uh, perceived by, by, by the community. So what's next? So uh, currently we are in phase one, uh, we are mapping out the RLOs. Uh, so the mapping out of the RLOs will be finalized by the end of November, 2021. And uh, uh, after uh, two weeks, uh, we will start uh, uh, also the actual data collection, the field data collection. And by the end of February, uh, 2022, we are expecting the data collection to be finalized. And uh, by the end of uh, May, 2022, the final report will be ready. A uh, similar study like this is also being uh, taking place in the Middle East, uh, like it is taking place in the East Africa. So uh, collaborative works uh, are being expected. Uh, so uh, Middle East countries that the research takes place are Jordan, Turkey, and Lebanon. And uh, so uh, the so studies, uh, the comparative study that we are going to conduct is not only limited to East Africa, but also it's uh, across region as well. And uh, I thank you so much. And I will give I will leave the floor for Mary to um, give us a conclusion. I thank you. Um, thank you very much to the presenters and uh, thank you to the audience for your attention. Uh, so during uh, this first phase, the early stages of the study, uh, the team has experienced uh, a few challenges. And one of the questions that, uh, that the team had, one of the challenges that the team had uh, was in identifying refugee-led organizations in Ethiopia, uh, Tanzania, uh, because the two countries uh, have a uh, setting whereby there are very uh, few refugee-led organizations. Uh, some refugee organizations are for profit and others are for uh, faith-based are faith-based organizations. And next, we're also looking at uh, the inclusion and exclusion criteria in Kenya and Uganda, uh, whereby uh, there are more refugees, relatively more refugees compared uh, to uh, their counterparts, which are Ethiopia and Tanzania. So uh, this session is the question and answer session. I will encourage anyone with a question to raise up their hand using the hand symbol that is on their screen. Uh, you are also allowed to make use of the chat box. So um, thank you and uh, you're very much welcome. <laughs>